Nico Anan plays Uncle Cliff in P Valley. I'm Matt Noble of Gold Derby, and I wanted to start off by asking you, Nico, what was the biggest challenge for you in season two of the show? <clears throat> Oh, man. Well, dang. Go ahead. Come out the gate with it. Why don't you? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one of the biggest challenges, uh, there were so many, but I'm going to say actually uh, portraying the pandemic, um, the emotional and psychological components that came about uh, with that were so real because they were also so fresh. You know, we were just coming out of it, but um, having to tap into some of those feelings and and thoughts during that time it was really 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 heavy you know uh one of my parents was had actually contracted covid and was in the hospital and i think that that was something that was uh fresh and triggering when i would think about uh uncle clifford's grandmother ernestine played by loretta divine when she was going through her bout with covid and like it just was all just so the weight of all of that that would be the most challenging i would think the psychology behind it all, train the character in that way. Yeah, and I think, like, that's interesting because, like, part of the show and part of your character is so much around the importance of the people that make up the pink and the importance of the people in life, while at the same time something's going on in the real world, which is reminding you of how important people and relationships are. So, yeah, yeah like, is sort of anything on that sort of parallel or just on – the role of Cliff in terms of the relationships that were important to him in season two. Say that to me in another way. Yeah, no, 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 that's fair. Um, I think like how um, did that help you appreciate the relationships that your character had in the show? I knew that because of the, the COVID of it all, and people like losing life. For example, seeing um, in the first episode, losing Tydell Ruffin, the, the, the mayor of Chuckalisa, played by my friend Isaiah Washington, you know, that let me know how tender life is. Um, and that then in terms as playing Uncle Clifford, let me know, hey, people could be gone at any moment. You could be gone at any moment, you know, your dreams could be slipping away at any moment, whether it was the ownership of my small business as Uncle Clifford, you know, in the pink, there was that that's akin to so many people that were small business owners in real life and how they had to adjust to, oh, I have to go online now. Wait, you know, my shipments aren't in person. Like, how do I get this? Even trying to order a car. It was hard in the pandemic or to get like your a new refrigerator you want to do these home designs but it was like oh it's everything is delayed six months and da, 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 da. you know there was just this trickle down effect that people would not i don't think originally have thought of that the pandemic would have provided but it was a real thing so i thought about how the relationships between uncle clifford and mercedes were just even more tight and all of the girls and and it was a everything became an, an event because we were locked up for so long. You were in home and you were in your PJs and in your sweats and your boxers and things like that. So everything became an event. I know for me, whenever I made my pe peanut butter and jelly sandwiches in the pandemic, they were gourmet. You know, <laughs> I was roasting pecans to go over my almond butter and the toasted, you know, bread and then spreading fresh blueberries on. It, I was like, why are you doing all this, Nico? Just put on some preserves and keep it moving. <laughs> but I was like, no, I have time. I, let, me, let me go deep. <laughs> so, yeah, everything became a little more important. And if anyone can put on an event, it's Uncle Clifford. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Got the gift of that, you know, imagination. Let your imagination go. Uh, like, do, uh, do you think the character, uh, do you think she evolved at all in season two of the show? Oh, extremely. I, I think that the character literally, you, you get to see more of who Uncle Clifford is, um, the machinations of her mind. Um, I think you get to see the battles of her heart, you know, tugging back and forth. I think it's no different. Sometimes I, the beautiful thing, I think, is that regardless of how you identify as a person, the audience, you can relate to Uncle Clifford because she's kind of like 
every every person, I don't want to say every man, but every person, you know. Um, so whether you are, you know, a cis heterosexual woman that's dealing, that's a, in a corporate position, that's dealing with dating this blue collar worker man, you know, and, and, and the differences between your, your work environments, but you know, there's a connection between the two. And how do you make that meet when you want to go out and go to a five-star Michelin restaurant and they want to go to the drive-in, you know, how do you match those worlds? And I think that you get that parallels a little bit to Uncle Clifford and Little Murder. I think that many different spaces, whether you are a man, an older man dating a younger person, you know, it's, it's a lot of connection there and space for opportunity for people to relate. So, yeah. Mm. Did you have a favorite scene in season two? Hmm. One of my favorite, I have a lot. Um, I love, I love the dance scene when you get to see Uncle Clifford on the pole because uh, that was like a piece of, like that was like a little nugget uh, and a jewel of information that I've always known about uh, Uncle Clifford's past, that she is a dancer and, and her love of dance helped create this whole world um, because it gives intention to it. You know, things, I, I think people sometimes can be swept away by the sensationalism of the show, but actually realizing that it's grounded in something real, that it's grounded in truth and principle for these characters. They're not just saying words and doing random acts. They're all truly intentional. Um, but the first thing that's coming to my mind is when Loretta Devine is singing, Till You Come Back to Me in episode seven. Um, and that scene, because it was shot so beautifully and you get to be able to see the history of this place, this pink, it's not just a strip club, but you see how it was the juke joint back in the seventies. And when you go back to the sixties, you see how it was a cotton mill. And I think to be able to see how this one space has been transformed over time, it gives again, another level of credence to the story. And then when you have the Loretta Devine giving gift with her voice you know it's everything and you get to see Uncle Clifford's history and seeing her mom come to life you know from the the, the afterlife coming back to get grandmother it, it's just an emotional scene but also beautiful fantasy and I love how it was shot and everything so yeah yeah and like seeing sort of like how the pinks transformed over time makes me think of like you as an actor like your whole job is being transformed over time and different <laughs> characters and different people how has this role transformed you this role has transformed me because it's allowed me to be more i think um audacious and authentic in my own life i've always been a person that has walked in my own truth um, and I never fit into the confines that society kind of gives me or tries to, you know, provide. But this role is just a space where, you know, you can spread your wings and you can do all things. I think that on paper, some people, because of their previous biases uh, with character and with Black characters and queer characters specifically, can be very limited and how they see them. And I think that um, being able to play Uncle Clifford is something that allows me to flex. It allows all of those things to just literally be gone. And, you know, you can just be whatever you are that day. It's like the Phoenix. Mm, yeah, I like it. Yeah. Rising from the ashes. Um, oh, do you, no. oh. <laughs> do, do it, like, is there something you've learned or grown in from playing Cliff? Um, I learned... I definitely learned that I can handle a lot of dialogue in this script. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you know what, what I've grown and I'll say what I've grown in, I've grown in my ability to have meaningful relationships with other artists. And when I say that, I'm talking about with, uh, specifically within the creative process. I come from the world of being an actor and a choreographer and where um, my world is consistently expanding beyond just the one. Um, and to be able to be in the space where I'm working with the different writers in the writer's room, um, the different producers, because it's a story that I care about so much, because it's a story that I've been with for so long, um, there is, there's never a space, Matt, of like, I know all the answers. It's very laboratory based and like, mm -hmm. let's try this or this part when we were writing the story, um, these were some of the things, these were some of the trepidations and that we encountered. And 
Do you feel any of that as the actor? And how can you bring some of that to this performance to give it more nuance and more texture? I appreciate that. And uh, I've been able to really grow in that space here because it's not always like what I think in my head, boom, go. Uh, sometimes I literally just have to not worry about what I'm going to quote unquote look like, um, really just be in the moment. And I really uh, have been appreciative of that opportunity as an artist to be able to do that because it brings out some good stuff. Mm, that's nice. Um, the, the, going back to the poll, uh, the, the scene where uh, you took to the poll, what was it like filming that? Like, mm. what was it? yeah. Oh, it was very hard. I kept asking myself, why did they wait till I was over 30 to give me a role like this? I was like, ah, oh. you know, um, I had to definitely go back to my dance days and get, you know, my hamstrings and my hips open and stretch and all that stuff. But again, luckily, because I have a background in dance, um, mm -hmm. that it was still halfway there. It was still halfway there. And I had an opportunity to be able to really, really, really be blessed in the space of, well, I have a double, you know, my double is Bentley Rebel. And it was like tag team. I would say it was like WWF. It was like tag team wrestling, you know, because, for, you know, for insurance purposes and everything, you can't do all of the filming for the <laughs> yourself because you then have to do other scenes afterwards. Uh, but having the communication of like, this is how Uncle Clifford moves. This is how she is going to dance. So you emulate this, I emulate that, and then we get it together. Um, it's a beautiful partnership. Um, but that scene in and of itself, that, ooh, that was about a good six hours. Wow. Yeah, because the camera's on the pole with you sometimes. Mm -hmm. The camera the camera person sometimes is on a separate crane and following you as you climb up the pole. Like, it, the, the camera is inside the dance in this world so that you can experience it as an audience member. You experience what the dancer is, is experiencing. Because being on the pole, Katori Hall always says, sometimes rising feels like falling and falling feels like rising. So to be able to be in the whirlwind of the emotion of it all while in the physical is the is the goal yeah and you've yeah. got like um and uh, like did you sort of tag in and out or did you do all of your scenes like on the pole and then all of your double scenes or was it like switching back and forward between oh you switch back and forth yeah back and forth. It's, it's the remember again it's mm. not just the actor the, the camera crew the crew is in yeah. that different too so when yeah. they're set up on their when they're set up on their crane and they're upside down. You go do it. Okay, great. Boom. Switch out. Boom. Because somebody yeah. is upside down with a fifty-pound camera. You know. Yeah. Wait. Your shot. And it really shows how, like, the old shows such a, and television in general, such a collaborative effort because you know oh. you've got then you've got the editor that has to then get the different takes and then go between both of them and stuff. So it's really yeah. That's why yeah. you don't have space for, especially on a show like this, you don't have space for ego. You know, mm -hmm. you don't have space for, for that kind of uh, limited thinking because this show, it is a monster. It is a beast. I remember when uh, Tamara, Tamara from, she directed season one, episode four, and she came into the locker room and she was like, this is like Game of Thrones. And I said, what do you mean? She said, it's such a whole other world. Every room is a whole other world. And I've never seen this. And as a director and as a white woman, honestly, not from the South in America, coming into this world and feeling and honoring and opening her mind to all of that, it was excellent. And I felt like when you, when you have that kind of perspective, you're able to digest these characters for who they really are and not who you think that they might be. Mm. You, you said how, like, you know, when you're on the pole, falling feels like rising, rising feels like falling sometimes. Was there a moment, like, you as an actor in the series where maybe uh, falling uh, felt like rising or rising felt like falling? I'm going to say when Uncle Clifford is at Beulah's grave site, mm. um, huh, that episode uh, was really heavy in that moment specifically. One I remember because it was freezing cold. Everyone else is bundled up and <laughs> Uncle Clifford is out there in this, this scarf chiffon outfit and some, some denim shorts. Yeah, but I remember having to have that confession when Uncle Clifford is confessing to her mother's grave that I'm afraid of coming here because I feel like I failed. 
I feel like I've been failing. And to say that one to a parent is one thing, but to say that to a parent that is deceased during a pandemic, when you're at the brink of losing another paternal member of your family, your grandmother, there was just so much. There was like literally a dam that was emotionally on the break of, of, of opening. There were so many cracks I felt in the spirit. Um, so that would be the scene for me that really did that for me. Yeah. Oh, no, that's a great one. Um, have you, Nico, been able to follow rule 55.99? Let me ask you this, man. What is 50, rule 55.99? Even when there ain't no money raining, dance like it's your last night. Is that the one? <laughs> yes, I have. Yes, I have. I love that you actually knew the number and that you knew what it meant. Yes, I have been able to apply it into my real life because, listen, listen, you know, the pandemic is real. I'm, I'm, you know, we all have heard about it and everything like that, but work is different now. Work is different now, whereas literally I would be in a studio with you. Here we are in our mm. own respective spaces across the world speaking to one another. Mm. And this is still real. And this yeah. is still a real connection and a real interview and a real conversation that we are mm. having with one another. So even if it ain't no money, Raina, even if we ain't in the, in the space where we got a green room or you got to go over here and you got to go get your eggs and I got to go over here and get my tea, you know what I'm saying? Like, now we still in a real place dancing like it's our last night, like making it happen. Um, I feel like that's what one of the things that we all have had to do in this moment. Yeah, and like I, 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 you, you grilled me on this rule last time we spoke, so that I need to remember what it is you for better. this time. That's yeah, right. um, so you be, you've managed to keep twerking, Nico. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What you got? Uh, well, I don't know. Sitting oh, down, what? you did this that big uh, like this. What is what? that? What's that? Come on, come on now. Know. I don't know. You, I... you show me. You show me. That's I'm like. That's a shimmy, man. That's a yeah, shimmy. shimmy. Yeah. What? Okay. What's a twerk? Like, show you show me a twerk. Uh, like, if really shimmy's easier. Shimmy's easier to do when you're sitting than a twerk. I feel okay. You you are right, and you know what this just says to me. What does it say to you? Can run over there that you cannot come and work at the bank. That's what it says. You oh have to go no! To what? <laughs> Unless you're serving drinks, you can't come work at the bank. That's <laughs> God, it's like um, oh, no, like, not not inclusive enough for for a shimmy for a shimmy in uh, Australia. No, 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 you that means that you have to go. You got to go Mercedes Dance Studio and learn. Okay, how to get to work that that is home. very fair. That is very. Good. Do you want to show me anything, Nico? Do you want to show it's done? You don't have. No, nope. I want. You know what I want to do? If I'm gonna show you something, I'm gonna show you episode two hundred one for you to start your journey okay. on second second season of Pea Valley, and you will see plenty plenty okay. of twerk. <laughs> that's what it is fantastic um i'm actually speaking uh speaking of mercedes i'm talking with brandy evans very soon right when i'm okay. done with you do you have any good questions for or anything oh uh, give me two seconds give me two seconds i can do that. um yes you should ask her about the Inter breaking the generational curse that Mercedes gets to experience in season two, the generational curses that she gets to break. And I say that because specifically, I think all of us um, had a journey of working through the different um, the different strongholds in the generations, because I think about how grandmother Ernestine, played by Loretta Devine, how her character handled finances and how that was then transferred down to Beulah, played by Niale Ali um, and as Uncle Clifford's mother. And then how that gave just um, experience and context to for you seeing how Uncle Clifford flubs the bills or maybe misspends uh, funds at different places. And then being able to see Uncle Clifford have the switch of oh, there's a casino coming to town. A casino is gonna bring these kinds of people. That means this kind of money. And you're seeing the business woman, the business mindset that Uncle Clifford has. And I think that 
that is in turn Uncle Clifford's way of breaking a generational curse there, also at letting love in. You know, when she says, what's wrong with you letting love walk out the door and experiencing and letting love um, in the door with little murder. Um, and I think that when you see, and you ask this question of Brandy Evans, when she plays Mercedes, I think you'll be able to see a whole different thing and see why it's important that women have rights over their own bodies. Mm, yeah, no, that's cool. I will ask her that. Nico, thanks so much for chatting with us again. People watching this interview can go to goldderby.com to make your own awards predictions and join the discussion in our forums. All the best of luck with the upcoming TV awards on the circuit and next year for the Emmy Awards, Nico. Thanks so Thank much. You. Thank so you. Thank you.